He's the second year head coach of the Utah Jazz. It's Will Hardy. And look, man, uh, six in a row, four on this homestand. No wonder we we heard back from the team being like, Will is available now. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was looking through it um, because, you know, last year you start 10 and three. And then at the 42 game mark, you're 20 and 22. And you know, I think me, like a lot of people were like, oh, that was kind of cute. You know, in the beginning, caught some people off guard. And then I think of this year, and you start seven and sixteen. I was like, yes, yeah, I don't know. That's probably a loaded West. That might be who they are. And now you're twenty two and twenty. Uh, I think that's kind of lost a bit. And it's like, oh wait, they're good. They're they're in it now in the playoff stuff. What's been different about the start of this year to where you've been the last month? Yeah, I think obviously last year we had zero expectations. Um, we had just made two massive trades. The narrative around the team was we're going into a rebuild. Um, and we had some guys that really had a chip on their shoulder. And we also had some good players on the roster. Um, you know, Mike Conley being a veteran point guard, I don't think that, you know, you can undersell the value of that when you're a first time head coach and you've got kind of all these moving pieces happening around us. Um, he was a real steadying force for us early in the year. And, um, we also squeezed out some close games early in the year. It wasn't like we were rolling people up. We won a couple games in overtime. Um, and I think that maybe had the record a little bit misguided early in the year. Um, we were playing well. I'm not sure we were 10 and three good. Um, but as the season went on, things changed. And, uh, you know, this year we had, a little bit of expectation because people had seen Lowry Markinen and the season that he had and Jordan Clarkson had a good year the year before and we signed him to an extension and we did have a little bit of cohesion in certain spots. Um, and so I think the narrative was, hey, they showed last year they can be competitive. Let's see if they can take a step this year. Um, but we also drafted three rookies and Keontae George is in the mix. Um, you know, we don't have a veteran point guard at the moment and John Collins coming in, it was going to be like, how are we going to fold him in? How does he fit next to Lowry? How does he fit with Walker Kessler? What are those things going to, you know, do to the, the lineups every night? And it's taken us a little bit of time to figure out what groups work best. Um, I think we all get caught up on who starts and that narrative tends to be one that's talked about a lot like he's a starter he's a starter oh he's out of the lineup oh he's in the lineup um and for us it's been about trying to maximize the full 48 minutes like what groups work best together how do we get through the game without having massive drop-offs and then as we get to the end of the game we'll try to do whatever makes the most sense um every night's different matchups are different some nights we need more space. Sometimes we need more size. Um, some nights this guy's playing great. Some guys, some nights this guy is not. Um, and so lately we've just found a good rhythm of the balance of the groups, I think. And credit to the guys because early in the year, you know, again, we're 7 and 16. It's not feeling great. It would have been very easy from like a human nature standpoint to just kind of shut down a little bit buy into what people were saying about our team um but they've really dug in the environment here every day has been fantastic like these guys are having a great time but they're also working hard um they're pulling for each other i think we've all kind of figured out how to accentuate each other's strengths a little bit and now it's about trying to you know cling to that as much as possible i always feel like there's this unsolvable conflict despite how on the same page a coaching staff and the front office can be and, and the conflict is that it's like look we just drafted all these guys we've got to get them minutes we've got to develop them and you're like yeah but i still have guys on my team that have been around a long time that are thinking about their next contract because when i look at your rotations like you're you're playing a significant number of guys and, and it's not just oh the ninth guy plays like four minutes so you can see that you're kind of mixing and matching it depending on that matchup so how do you balance you know, reward and development, knowing that you're, you're kind of serving two different things here at the same time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of days where it feels like you're fighting a war on two fronts and that's not always easy. Um, 
I think that the the most important thing for me is that you know the locker room is an ecosystem and it's a living breathing thing and we have to make sure that the team knows that we're trying to put our best foot forward every day um there are lots of ways to develop game minutes are very important but that's also why you have the G League and you try to use that with really young players to get them a ton of game reps um players that earn real minutes in the NBA games, well, they'll play. Um, but we didn't want to turn this into a feeling of like, hey, we're here for these couple of people's development and the rest of you are just kind of props around them. Um, I just feel like that's a really dangerous thing to get into in terms of like what it feels like every day here. Um, we want the team to to know and feel like we're trying to win every night and we're trying to prepare to win. We're trying to put them in a situation where they can be successful. So um, it is hard some days because like, you know, Keontae, for example, is a rookie guard that's in our rotation and I'm looking for opportunities to put him in spots to be successful. I'm also looking to give him opportunities to play through some mistakes and I don't believe that, you know, the game's perfect and that you have to play perfect. He needs to be able to learn how to deal with some mini failures in a game and keep pushing. But there's also some nights where it's like, hey, man, you got to come sit down because we're trying to win and you don't have it right now. And those decisions are not always easy. Like there's not a perfect science to it. That's why I have a staff. Um, and I, I don't think I always get it right. There's nights where I'm like, man, maybe I left him in too long. There's nights where I'm like, ah, maybe I was a little bit short on the leash tonight. But, um, you know, that's where I feel as a coach, like it's nice to have 82 of these things because I don't feel the pressure of like, I only have 15 chances to do this the right way. Um, because Keontae is a young player and he's a young person. And so like, I recognize the ebbs and flows that will come with that. So we're just trying to do our best to have him. Like, I think he's better now than he was the first day of the season. And that's what's important to me. Doesn't mean that today he'll be better than he was yesterday. Like, you can have little ups and downs along the way. We just want to make sure the big picture is is trending up. I want to go back uh, because I love your story. And, you know, everybody that's successful, you're kind of like, what was that turning point? How old were you when you knew you weren't going to play in the NBA? Oh man. Uh when I knew I wasn't going to play in the NBA. <laughs> yeah, where maybe you told people publicly you knew you weren't, but deep down you were like, you know, 66. I mean, 16, <laughs> 17, like yeah, something like that, 17. Yeah, it's where you kind of come to grips with the Yeah, it's like, okay, but I I can shoot and that's fine, but it wasn't like North Carolina was beating down my door. Um it's it, it wasn't that I didn't love basketball and wasn't competitive. I think there's just a moment where the game kind of tells you that you're not even really in the conversation. Um, so, yeah, probably 17. Okay. Yeah, look, that's that's great. I mean, that, I'm actually impressed that. It, so you end up at Williams, uh, a school, a smaller school that I know in Massachusetts. And I've heard you tell the story, but I want to share it with the audience and kind of like, the path of of what led to you getting into the basketball world to to have an internship with the Spurs, but there's a backstory there that that actually takes a really long time before you even realized it was an option. So if you could tell us that, it'd be great. Yeah. Um, so I was going to school at Williams, and um, I had met an older couple who lived in town. They were a part of our we called it the Hoop Group, which is basically the Division Three version of boosters i guess like they're people that lived in town and loved the team and followed us and supported us and took care of us um i had met uh coach tong and his wife jinx at a hoop group event you know a dinner we had after a practice and i got to talking with them and uh you know through the conversation they were talking about how they were moving a bunch of stuff at their house and trying to make some transitions at their house and you know, I just kind of spouted off and was like, oh, well, if you ever need any help, let me know. And, you know, kept it moving, kept the conversation going like, all right, you guys have a good night. And uh, the next day I got a phone call from Jinx 
like, hey, this is Jinx Tong from last night. I got your number from coach. Uh, you know, you said you would be willing to help us move some stuff at the house. Like, that would actually be amazing. And I'm kind of like, oh, no, dude. Like, why did you open your mouth? Like, it was one of those things, like I said in passing, it's not like you didn't mean it, but you also weren't expecting the call the next day. Um, and it's one of those moments where you're just like, look, you got to stand and deliver. Like you told these people you'd help them. They called, they're asking for your help, go over there. So I went over, helped him move some stuff. And that was kind of the beginning of our relationship. Um, they took care of me for a couple of years at school. Like they were, I don't know, surrogate grandparents, parents, whatever. Like they would check in on me. They became a part of my pregame routine. The women's team would be playing before us conference games. I would go get my ankles taped. I'd go sit in the stands with Coach Tong and his wife on the way back to the locker room, and they would just ask kind of general, how you doing, how's school, have you met any nice girls, like that kind of stuff. Like it, they were, they really did feel like family in that way. Um, and this relationship went on for a couple of years. Cut to two weeks before graduation. Um, I'm 22. I'm clueless. I am graduating with an English degree from a liberal arts school. I've applied to jobs in eight different fields. Um, some basketball, some I think will, you know, my English degree will go to good use. Some are just like, hey, I would love to live in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm a grew up in Virginia and Richmond, had some friends moving there. So it was kind of spread out trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I got a call one day from Jinx that said, hey, Coach Tong uh, would like to meet with you. He's down watching tennis practice, which he did frequently in the spring. Weather turns in Massachusetts. He would go sit down by the tennis courts and watch tennis practice. We had plenty of meetings there. So I went down, sat with him. This is, again, two weeks from graduating. And he asks, have you thought about what you're going to do after college? And it's like, well, yeah thought a lot about it actually I'm kind of panicking um, I've applied to a bunch of jobs and I'm not really sure if any of them are going to work out um, I've had a couple interviews it seems to be going okay and he goes oh well, I have a job I think you should apply for and I said well, what's that he's like I think you should work for the San Antonio Spurs I'm like well that's a really great idea um, but what makes you think that I even have a remote chance at getting that position He's like, oh, I don't know if I've ever told you, but um, when I was the athletic director at Pomona, Greg Popovich was the head coach. We've been best friends for 20 years. Which led to like a mini argument of sorts because I'm like, look, man, like I've been coming to your house for years, a couple of years now. I'm on the basketball team. You know that I sit in my apartment and watch NBA games frequently during the week. It never crossed your mind to bring up that Greg Popovich is one of your best friends. Like that connection didn't seem like a conversation we could have at a dinner at any point. He's like, oh, no, I guess, you know, I never thought of it. So uh, I sent my resume to San Antonio. Um, I was actually writing my last paper of college in the library, like grinding it out, like a couple pages left. And you're like, I'm going to push send. College is over. I'm going to go party with my friends. It's going to be great. And uh, I got a phone call from a random number that had a San Antonio uh, area code. And so I picked up and it was this like deeper voice that was like, is this Will? And I was like, yes. He goes, this is Greg Popovich. And I was like, oh my God, like, hold on one sec. I got to run out of the library. So I like run out. I end up talking to Pop on the phone for like three minutes. I'm scared to death, have no idea what's going on. And he's like, oh, you know, we're still in the middle of our season. You know, this is May at this point season's still going on and uh you know we're trying to figure out what we're going to do but we'll be in touch okay so i hang up i didn't hear from them for probably a month six weeks maybe and i just kind of like thought hey maybe they looked at my resume and i'm not the fit i'm not the person whatever and so i'm just kind of moving on with some other job stuff taking that down the track um and then about the middle of july I got a phone call back from the Spurs, ended up doing a couple of phone interviews with them. Um, then they flew me down to San Antonio to do a last face-to-face -face interview. Um, and kind of the first part of August of 2010, they offered me a position to be an intern actually for R.C. Buford working on the front office side. 
and I drove to drove to Texas for a one year internship uh, working in the front office and left 11 years later an assistant coach on pop's bench married with a daughter and another one on the way so uh, I kind of grew up in San Antonio in a lot of ways There's obviously a ton of stories in between those 11 years but um, it's crazy like how that connection and that random hoop group dinner and me offering to move a few boxes uh, somehow has resulted in me sitting here talking to you. I know when you went to Boston with Ime, you know, there's there's some stories how Ime had said, like, look, not every place is San Antonio, because like San Antonio is your only world that you understand. You're there at such a young age. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's honestly like the standard for what you would want for your organization when San Antonio was running it for as long as they were. Uh, what to you now that you've had, I don't know that you could answer this question properly without the Boston Utah experience, but what is different about San Antonio? What makes it so special? Um, I mean, I think for a lot of us that were there when I was there, you know, I think working number one for a coach who has established himself in a place and you don't really feel like you're looking over your shoulder. Um, there was an unbelievable trust in pop and his relationship with RC and with ownership there. Like everything just felt pretty stable every day. Um, I also think that like, I mean, when you talk about hall of fame players being in one place for a long time, you know, Tim, Tony and Manu are really the reasons that everything there happened. Um, pop was a huge part of it, but like, look at the NBA right now. Like, could you imagine three guys that are that good staying in the same place for 15 years together? And at times, everybody taking a little bit less on their contract and um, making those financial sacrifices and maybe making some statistical sacrifices at times just to keep the thing together. Um, I think the stability of those three guys and you couple that with pop, who is the perfect match for the three of them. Um, it really set the tone for the whole place every day. We didn't worry about, you know, our star players being unhappy and leaving. Um, we didn't worry about them asking for pop to get fired. And like, I think that there's realities that are a part of the NBA now that come with the territory, but, um, the way that Tim, Tony and Manu approached their relationship and the three of them staying together, I really think is something that, um, we may never see again. I know you didn't have Ainge in, in Boston, but, uh, along with Justin Zanuck, uh, guys you're working with in Salt Lake, can you give me the pop scouting report versus the Ainge scouting report? <laughs> what do you mean? just whatever you want it to be, man. Like you're, you're an advanced uh, scout, but you're not, uh, I mean, we're not sizing up their games here. Yeah, no. Um, pop, uh, they're both one of a kind. That's a fact. Like they are both very much one of one. Um, pop has a, side of him that the whole world sees and then he has a side of him that people that are on the inside get to see and pop is a uh, very tough and sometimes short with the media and all those things um but he has a an unbelievable way of caring for all of his people um every single day in the organization um DA is DA all the time and he has no filter. And, uh, I think that's probably where they differ. Pop keeps some things, uh, when he's speaking to people in public, I think DA has an unreal ability of number one, seeing the good in everybody. Um, and number two, he has a really unique skill that I'm, I'm wish I could steal from him of like, he can tell you, blunt truth 
even if it's 100% disagreeing with you and not make you feel bad or feel like you're being, uh, like he's being combative. It's a, it's a gift. I don't know how he does it, but like I've had conversations with DA where, you know, two sentences into him talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, like he's telling me that he thinks the exact opposite of what I just said, but in a way that doesn't make me defensive. Um, but they're both, uh, they're both unique. I, I would say that the similarity in the two of them is probably two of the most competitive people I've ever been around. Like day to day in everything they do, the way that they keep that fire burning hot in that regard is, uh, is special. I want to talk about the job of being a head coach in the NBA now. And, you know, I'll, tr I'll try to keep up as much as I can, but I, I can't help but think, obviously, because your age, you know, you're the second youngest coach. Um, that plays into it. There's probably moments where you felt like, I can't believe this is real and I'm in San Antonio. I can't believe I'm the lead assistant here in Boston. But then it's like, no, this is actually my team. Like, it's, it's funny how life works where you can feel like, I have no idea where I'm going to be in a couple of years. And then it just skips all these turns for now. It's like, I can't believe now I'm doing this. So that first game was Denver last year, right? At home. Yep. Did you walk out and then like I just don't know that anybody in that spot couldn't be having just little moments of like I can't believe this is actually happening and I, I know that that may not be anything you even want to admit but did you have moments where you're like hey should I argue with a ref here it's been like three minutes um because I'm supposed <laughs> to argue with refs you know do I call a timeout here do I yeah. like what's my first time out hey I don't like the way we're covering this oh hey, hey my guy wants a challenge in the first quarter do I do that to show him a player's guy or do I not do it because I'm going to show that I'm not a player's guy because I'm young and people are already wondering I'm going to walk all over how did you handle because I can't like any a lot of people would want to pretend like no that didn't really happen I was prepared I'd done preseason all this different stuff I think that'd be all bullshit because I, I just think any normal person would have a few moments in that first game as an NBA head coach where you're you're thinking about some of these things, even though you know you're not supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not uh, I'm not ashamed or afraid to be very honest. Like I still have some of those moments, um, but last year was a whirlwind. Like the beginning of the year, in particular, um, you know, when you talk about like feeling stress, when you talk about like feeling nerves in a way that you've never felt them before. Um, I mean, I'll go back even before the first game. Like, our first practice at training camp, practice ended, and we all brought it in, and we put our hands up. And I'm like, my brain is like, as an assistant coach, you just, you're kind of listening. But it was dead silent for like five seconds, and then I was like, oh, shit, I'm supposed to talk. Like, I forgot that, like, I was the person that was supposed to, like, wrap up practice with the little message and then, like, bring it in. And, like, it, I still have moments of, like, oh, man, everyone's looking at me. Like, I'm supposed to say something right now. I'm supposed to do something. Um, the first game last year, though, was, like, we had this new team. It all made sense at practice. You don't really know what it's going to look like. You're playing the Nuggets. They're a great team. You know, we've got the home fans there, the owners there, my mom's in town. It's like, just can tonight please just not be a train night? Like, can we somehow get to the end and people are like, oh, he seemed like he kind of knew what he was doing. Like, can we just get like that report card at the end of the game? But yeah, all those little things of, do I argue with the ref? Do I challenge? Do I this? Like, I left that game. I, I don't think I've ever been more tired after a game because your brain is just going a thousand miles an hour and you can't simulate it. And yeah, preseason happened, but it's nothing like that. Um, and you, it, it like made me think about also like times I was an assistant, like I'm trying to talk to the head coach and they're kind of like blank, like, cause they're, they're thinking something in their own head. Um, I remember walking out of the, the gym, one relieved that we won because I was like, Hey, I won't be the first coach ever to go. Oh, and whatever. Um, and secondly, like part of me was like, oh my God, I have to do that 81 more times this year. Like I'm exhausted. Um, so yeah, it's, a it's a, it's a whirlwind because you get pulled in a lot of different directions. I think you, I think about things now that I never thought about as an assistant. 
the things that I'm worried about are way different than the things I was worried about when I was an assistant. Um, like I'm still learning how to do this job. I don't feel like I have it all figured out. I'm way more comfortable now than I was the first game against Denver last year. But I think last year, one of the things that helped me early on was some of the veteran guys we had on the team. Like Mike Conley, what he did for me last year, you know, Mike and I are the same age, which is weird on its face. But like the relationship that we had early in the year, being able to bounce things off of him, some of the other guys on the team um, was good to kind of know like, hey, you guys don't think I'm crazy doing this, do you? Like this, does this make sense to you? Um, you know, Rudy Gay, who was on our roster, I had coached in San Antonio. And so I had a pre-existing relationship with Rudy and like he was really helpful for me last year. So like, I think it's, you have to lean on different people at different times. But I still go into the games with nerves. I still have a lot of moments of doubt. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Was that message okay? But um, you got to have people around you that will tell you the truth. <clears throat> I think last year I had a lot of that. I think this year I still have a lot of that. Um, because, yeah, being an NBA head coach is hard. Like, the people that want to say, like, oh, I, I've got it figured out and I know what I'm doing and – I prepared for this and all that, like, that's fine. Everybody, you know, everybody prepares, but when the lights come on and it all starts happening, um, your brain gets going pretty quick. What do you look for at the start of a game? Um, the start of the game, I think mostly, uh, we'll go to the defensive side. Um, you're trying to survive because you have adjustments that you have ready to go. You assume, or I assume, that we're not going to be able to play one way the whole game. But I'd like to get through the first four or five minutes without having to pivot to options two, three, and four, because now you have a long way to go. But I'm more like trying to look at like, hey, are the matchups correct? Did we think what we thought this morning or yesterday, does it make sense now, like seeing it in real time? Like, are these matchups going to work? Um, then you go to the offensive side and it's like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see because we play, a a varied style, we do a couple of different things. Like I'm almost trying to like test things out at times and see how they're going to guard it. It kind of informs me to what may be happening for the rest of the game. So, you know, there are moments in games where coaches will go to something, it works, and then they keep going to it. Early in the game, I would say I'm kind of doing the uh, appetizer sampler. Like I'm trying a couple different things to see how it's going to look um, and then talk to the staff and talk about what we've seen because um, 48 minutes is a long time. And like I don't want to try to be discovering something in the middle of the second quarter. So knowing I had you scheduled for this and I was – watching your games a little bit more intently and i went back and watched the fourth quarter against la and i was again i'm watching on the broadcast so you know it's not like i'm going to see you a ton especially on offense because you're on the other side and i was watching what you were doing and i i was noticing and it might have been with keontae where the only thing it really looked like you were doing and i'm sure you're doing more than this but you kept saying like other side other side you wanted to initiate the offense on the right side and is that pretty much like, hey, you know what you're supposed to do. And then beyond that, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and start yelling out a specific action every single possession. It, it seemed the priority seemed to be where you initiated. And then certainly once you got the subs kind of with your closing group, I mean, you want to talk about spacing. Had I not rewatched it, I don't know that I would have realized the emphasis on how far out your five out stuff was. I mean, it was. Incredible. And I think it also speaks to kind of your closing group where I go, man, I really like that they have four slash five guys with the ball in their hands that they can get more than two dribbles and still be kind of comfortable. And that's kind of how you lived offensively. So again, I'm using a very specific group that fourth quarter, that game, but, but I noticed it, it felt a little more hands off and it was more about how you were aligned. Yeah. Um, we try to communicate in dead moments, uh, timeouts, dead ball. So we had talked 
at that previous timeout about the couple of things we were going to try to go to. Um, because again, like when the game starts going and it's going up and down and it's loud, and you only have 24 seconds in a possession. Like I can't give a long winded thing to the team. And so you try to tell them like, Hey, these next two minutes, this is kind of what we're looking for. And then my job with Keontae was trying to point out some spacing. And yeah, in that game in particular, initiating it on that side of the floor was good for us. Um, Keontae likes his left hand. Um, and so it was like about trying to put him in a comfort zone and then also kind of where the action was going to go after that, like we felt like the spacing was good, but it's a, it's a longer conversation at a dead ball. And then that lets the conversation be shorter in that moment because they know what I'm referencing, if that makes sense. Um, the, the spacing piece is massive for us. Um, we need that, especially with guys like Colin Jordan, who can break guys down one-on-one -on -one off the bounce. Um, and we have to play some different spacings depending on who's in the game. Like in that game, John was in, which is great for us. Um, John has a versatile skill set. He can screen and roll. He can also space. It puts big guys in tough situations. When we have Walker in the game, we play a little bit of a different spacing. Um, and so, yeah, like, at that point in the game, we had stripped it down. It was pretty simple how we were trying to attack. Um, and Keontae's a young guard. Like, he's really bright. But in some of those moments, you're just trying to remind him his responsibility, which is like, if we can just start this in the right spot, then you guys can play, and I'm going to kind of get out of the way. Um, because there's a lot of... Uh, we try to coach in concepts, not necessarily in like on every play, you go here, you go here, you go here. Um, but sometimes the concepts can get screwed up if we don't start in the right spot. Cause I don't like when, you know, I think that the, there's, there's just so much that, you know, one of my favorite things and I've always told the story is working for minor league baseball and being around the coaching staff every single day of a baseball season. Like I remember just in that short, experience going whatever i thought i knew about how this worked like i i had no idea i just didn't and you know when people get on coaches and it's like oh they don't run anything it's like well <laughs> they're all running something i would say there's right. maybe been a few games the last couple of weeks where i was like yeah they're not doing that kind of favors but you know that's just me at home on it but it felt very and again i'm just picking this one game here but it felt very hands off it felt very popovich you know it felt like and and I I really think too we're in a stage now with the NBA where you know, I used to think like the prototypical point guard the greatest skill that he could have would be like hey we need we need something different on this possession we need a different look or this guy hasn't touched the ball and he averages eighteen a game so let me make sure that he's still engaged and I think we've lost a lot of that so then you can have some coaching styles where it feels like it's so dominant. And I know that you specifically said during this turnaround, quote, we stop focusing running plays on every single possession. And I think you have some of the playmakers for it, but I also think that there's a freedom that every basketball player, I don't care where you've been at, loves that kind of freedom, knowing that, hey, you know, ultimately it's on us to beat our guy or make the right read. It's not about Will over there designing what we do off the blitz or some screen on the baseline every single time, because that'd be an awful way to play basketball. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's where it comes back to me to like, we're trying to coach in concepts and if spacing is really important to us and making good decisions at the rim is really important to us. Okay. Well then I can hold the team really accountable to those two things. And I can allow them to have a little bit of, individual expression in how they do it um they're all unique like all these guys got to the nba playing their way and so their way doesn't totally suck like they got to the nba so they're all really good and i need to try to figure out how to maximize that and yeah there's parts that you have to try to refine or shave down to make it all fit together a little bit better but I also don't want them to lose their instinct because then they become frozen. Then they become overthinking because they're trying to like 
please me or do something that's unnatural to them. I think there's, when you make what you care about clear and you hold them all really accountable to those couple of things, but then you let them be themselves and you don't nitpick every dribble, every shot, every pass. You know, you give them a little bit of grace in those moments. I think they're really receptive to you holding them really accountable to the, hey, man, I told you these two things are what I care about. You know, like you want to dribble between your legs a few times and do a half spin on that move. Like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the coach that yells, like, you have to jump stop on every play. Like, I'm, I'm not doing that. Maybe that's not your thing. Some guys play the slow step with the Euro. Some guys do play off two feet, but they all have their own unique style. I'm not trying to make them all one thing. Um, and that's why, like, you know, from like a big picture thematic standpoint, like I say this to the team, like, this is not my program. This is ours. I am a part of it and I have a job to do. And sometimes that means I have to make tough decisions. That's part, that's my piece in this. But we all need to have ownership of it. And so I have to have a little bit of humility in like letting them be themselves at times and not trying to micromanage everything they do because their way, albeit not perfect on every possession, is pretty damn good. They're in the NBA. And so like, it's hard to tell a guy that got this far doing it his way that like, oh no, your way is terrible. It's no, your way is good. You could do this a little better and you could do that a little less. And that's where you try to like help them in the margins. But I think trying to strip them of their individuality for our group is counterproductive. And like trying to be overly controlling doesn't help the team. And so that means that there's times like I'm watching and things that are happening. It's like, I'm not necessarily in full control. Now I have timeouts and I can do those things. But like when the game's going up and down, like I don't care what any coach tells you, like you don't have control when the game's going back and forth, up and down, like on misses and the game's free flowing, like you're yelling things. Some of them they hear, some of them they don't. It's loud in there. Um, and so you're hoping that the concepts that you've coached them on in the quiet moments will show up when the game gets a little bit hectic. Some great answers in there, Will. Uh, this was a lot of fun and I, I really appreciate the time, you know, busy stretch of the season, but it's been nice to have you on, uh, during this, this big turnaround and, and in the mix there in a crowded West. So thanks again and good luck the rest of the year. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you.